Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Annie Bustos, I'm the Director of Marketing for TechLaw. I'm joined here today by my colleague, Peter Gorrell, who's the Senior Vice President of Customer Experience, an accomplished artist, radio show host for Journey to Success Radio, as well as a mentor with Reach of Newark, Canada. Welcome, Peter. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks very much, Annie. Uh, yeah, good to be here. Um, and today we have the great honor of uh, sitting and speaking with Chief Siddhar, Siddhar um, who is Industry Solutions Director for Retail of Microsoft, Big Data Ninja, and an exhilarant with the United States Coast Guard. Hi, good morning, Annie. Good morning, Peter, and good morning, everyone. Pleasure being yeah, here. Yeah, good morning, Sheesh. Thank you. So the topic for today's discussion is how to leverage business data to build omnichannel customer experiences. So with that, let's just get right into it. So there's no doubt that the rate of change in the retail market within the last five years is greater than any other time period that we've ever seen. New technologies such as social media and mobile devices have enabled customers um, the access to information such as price checking apps or other user reviews. So the first question to you, Peter, is how has some of these technology impacted customer behavior? Well, I think the uh, biggest change is the fact that the customer is uh, much more savvy today and has uh, access to so much information. And uh, I'm finding, uh, in particular, that there's a, an, an, uh, you'll read the reports that, that, that include some very incre increasing numbers uh, as uh, time evolves. But it currently looks like at least, 80% of research is done by savvy customers, uh, courtesy of technology. And of course, the ubiquitous uh, mobile phone seems to be just generating uh, a way at this information for people. They are much more savvy, and they crave personal attention. So, of course, some of our viewers and listeners today that aren't quite familiar with the whole concept of an omnichannel. Maybe you could walk us through what the difference between a multi-channel versus omnichannel strategy. Yeah, by all means. Um, yeah, well, imagine, if you will, uh, the multi-channel approach is actually you're either operating your store or you've got an online store or a mobile store, whereas the omnichannel is a convergence or a melding of the three with an integrated back end. So if there's some there's some activity that's generated between the retailer and the customer. I'll give you an example. For instance, um, you can either go you can either go to shop uh, into the store and buy something, or you can go to their online store that isn't integrated with their store. It's just a, an isolated case. Um, but then we have retailers who are actually integrating the their supply chains and and their 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 uh, service providers and allowing, by virtue of portal, access for the customers to, for instance, if they can't find a particular piece of uh, product that they're looking for in one place, that they can look into the retail chain and, and find that it's in another region and, and courtesy of their mobile can order it and bring it into themselves. So it's all about access. Uh, question to you, Shish. How has the new age shopper impacted retail, and what sorts of new challenges does it bring to retailers? Uh, this, uh, you know, the, the multitude of channels has really brought in a lot of challenges for retail. One of the words that's really surfaced over the last couple of years is uh, something called showrooming, where, you know, uh, Customers will walk into a brick and mortar store, will use their mobile devices, uh, compare prices, look at products, touch and feel the product, but really compare prices and buy it at a cheaper location through their mobile phone, typically online. And this has become a huge threat for brick and mortar stores. And on the flip side, uh, online retailers are also noticing a similar challenge. Uh, we're kind of calling it web rooming, where they will kind of go compare all the features and things like that online, know exactly what they want, 
and then walk into a brick and mortar store and buy it immediately. The instant gratification is really what they want. So on both sides, online retailers as well as brick and mortar retailers are facing huge challenges and competition from each other and all of these availability of channels, like for example, social media channels like uh, uh, Facebook and Pinterest are enabling a buy option and and customers can buy from these channels. They can also look for recommendations from customers. They can buy online and in-store. And retailers are now saying, how do we now look at the entire customer journey, connect with customers across these, and, and really engage with customers throughout that journey and influence them throughout the journey, know what customers have looked at online, and be able to have a more personalized experience. Today, there's a lot of data silos, and that creates a challenge for retailers because they don't know what the customer has been doing on a different channel. Interesting example, uh, uh, Sheesh, if you'll allow me. I know yep. it's, not quite, it's not quite retail, but I was, uh, I was visiting uh, with some friends in Toronto, and uh, uh, it, the day was uh, waning on, and uh, I, we, were, we were just touring Bloor Street. And we went by the uh, art gallery, and uh, and I actually took a I actually took a picture of the art gallery. It's a very dynamic building, and I tweeted it. And within seconds, I saw that the art gallery obviously must have been doing some social listening, picked up on my tweet, took my photograph, and processed it, and it became and it landed on their front page on their website. And they and they complimented me for the quality of this of this photograph and for visiting. I mean, I, I mean you can imagine how I felt. I mean that's so awesome. But I, I can just see take that element and weave that into a retail story, and it could happen. It it could really be make a difference. Exactly, and and that's really where retailers are going with Instagram. You take a picture of a product and post it. And that becomes a little advertisement place where you can say, buy me or buy it, right from that picture. Exactly. Yeah. So, this new age shopper, correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is this new age shopper has a very different buying cycle, whereas the traditional engagement model um, has been very linear and it's, it's a funneled approach, whereas the omnichannel model has just completely disrupted this. So, Shish, can you maybe talk to us a little bit more about what this new buying cycle or new engagement model looks like? Yeah, so, and you're right, it's, uh, you know, in, in retailers were used to the very linear model, and today because of the multitude of channels, and also the fact that, you know, research can be done, the buying process research can be done on any one of these channels, there is no specific path that they go through, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it doesn't mean that, you know, customers will research online and buy in store. It could happen the other way around as well. They could do the research in the store and then end up buying online or uh, do research through social channels and recommendations from friends and so on. So there is no predefined path at all. And this really poses a challenge in the way that retailers engage with customers completely changes. Uh, one of the things that we, we see as key here is because uh, customers go from one channel to another, it is extremely important that uh, retailers look at architectures that enable them to share the data of customers and their engagements throughout these uh, channel throughout the entire process so that when research is done on one channel and the customer moves on to the other channel, they have all the information of what the customer looked at, their past purchase history, uh, what they bought online, what they bought in the store, and be able to personalize uh, the offerings, be able to offer relevant uh, products to the customer and so on, engage with the customer knowing uh, what they did in a different channel. So. Uh, sharing of information and really breaking out of that siloed environment is extremely important in this new environment. The other hey, aspect, you know, yep. sorry, sorry, Chief. I, I say it, you something else resonated with me. It just it just reminded you just reminded me of something, and it's like 
it's almost like a newly formed word of mouth approach to business. You remember the old adage about, you know, that one customer is treated well and then he tells two customers and then she tells two friends and so on. There's an opportunity within the confines of the new and modern engagement uh, 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 model for interruption, right? Because yep. you, you may be on your way to buying something and then your best friend's going to like hit something on Twitter and say, I don't think you should do that. You know, I, I, I think you should look at this before you buy that. And, and those are the kinds of things that are happening to customers. But, and retailers really need to get a hold. I, I mean, I hate to be preaching that, but they really do need to get a hold of that scenario and understand the kind of framework and the architecture that's required in order to combat that. I agree. And, and you know, that contextual nature of it is extremely important. Uh, and with the availability of all kinds of data, like, for example, uh, I know that you probably like a cold coffee when the weather is 80 degrees and you're passing by a particular store, you're engaging with content in your mobile device. I could push that information out to you and say, it is 80 degrees out there. I know you typically like coffee uh, when, when the temperature is up there. You happen to be outside a coffee store. Why don't you take this 50% offer and and grab that coffee. So really that contextual nature uh, based on, you know, whatever channel you're on and what you're doing, uh, I think that that is the nature of the engagement that a lot of retailers are looking at and saying, today it is not just what do we do when you walk into the store, it is what are you doing in your mobile device right now, what's the temperature out there, what's your past purchase history and behavior, and using all this information together, we can engage with you in a more relevant manner. Yeah. So Peter, you touched on a really interesting point. Um, so I just want to close with this one last question. Mm -hmm. With so much external influences like social media and all of this disruption, how can retailers control the message and guide potential buyers down a controlled path? Well, I think it's. Uh, I think the answer lies within the within the structure of the engagement model itself. Is that given that there's an opportunity there to listen to the customer, take a look at what they're what they're viewing, when they're viewing it, what's their propensity to buy based on uh, various triggers, and and how do you want to message them? I think these are all considerations that need to be that need to be taken place uh, within the confines of this engagement model. So, as a marketer, this chart looks all too familiar to me. Um, I have data, I have campaign data, I have web-based data from email, um, CRM, social media data, as well as sales data. Um, how can organizations make sense of all of this? So, this, uh, you know, looking at this, this uh, image here, it looks very, very complex. And this is, again, one of those situations where retailers say, historically, we've been using uh, all the proprietary data that we have about the customer and making recommendations, optimizing our engagement, things like that, with the data we have. But today, there is all of these additional data points available of the engagement. our customer looked for online. We know what they looked for on the mobile device. We know what they purchased using mobile devices. We know the comments and reviews they posted in social media. If we have all that information and we can consolidate all that information, we have a much better picture of what our customer wants and may want and are able to uh, personalize that experience. Um, so a lot of cases, uh, what retailers are doing is just saying, we need to be able to, to integrate this information, pull all this information together and have that single view of the customer 
across all of these channels. And that's really what a lot of retailers are doing today. They're saying, in addition to uh, the, the single channel view of the customer, we want to be able to combine these data sources. And when we look up or engage with the customer, we're taking into account all of the searches they did, all the engagement they did, all the purchases they did across these channels so that our engagement becomes far more relevant. So that all sounds really great, but this slide looks very intimidating. So, um, I mean, let alone sort of the enterprises. For, for some of the listeners that might be uh, either mid-market or even small startups, how can they, if they don't have strong technical arms, how could they sort of tackle this, Peter? Well, so, go on. It, uh, sorry, Sheesh. I, I, um, the, the thing is, we deal every day with with this crazy roadmap that you see in front of you, and we have clients who uh, have things in play already, uh, have ideas with, with, at every size of uh, organization, be it mid-market, enterprise, even some small startups. And one of the real issues is that there's always so much data, and they don't even realize it. Some some are at the, some are at the stage where they they have no idea of utilizing the business intelligence that's in front of them. They're still using Excel spreadsheets to, you know, to work up reports. We, and when there's, you know, basically, I take the approach of trying to dumb this down a little bit. I go a little bit of a, I go a little bit of a, a listening exercise and looking for opportunities to partner uh, with uh, companies like Microsoft who have an incredible uh, technology stack that you know that have some very accessible and some uh, easily uh, easily affordable solutions uh, to help resolve some of these issues. I think it all starts with listening. I think it all starts with trying to understand what the customer really really wants out of this mail AM information. Many don't realize that they have a very empowering factor in front of them. They just have to put a light on it. So there's, there's lots of buzz going on around about the Internet of Things and big data. Shush, how has this impacted the retail industry? So uh, big data uh, for, for retailers, you know, the large volume of data is not new at all, but the variety of data available today is definitely new. Uh, I'd say in the last two to three years, there's been more data created than in the last 20 uh, mainly because, uh, as you can see from the slide, that middle slice, which is the social media data, there is a huge amount of data being created by the minute. Uh, this may seem like a lot of noise, but a lot of retailers are really taking this information and doing some interesting analysis and data mining from it to better understand what customers want. For example, at a very simple level, it could be a correlation that says, football is trending on Facebook and Twitter, and we see a correlated spike in beer sales. And, and a lot of retailers are, are, are really mining these interesting correlations from there and then picking up things like uh, the Lord of the Rings is trending on Twitter, and we notice an increased spike in travel to New Zealand, and those kind of interesting insights which they use in future forecasts. Uh, this also enables them to keep a pulse on customer sentiment about certain products and, and make decisions about should we continue investing in a certain category of service, should we discontinue based on the aggregated sentiment around that, that product or category. So it's a very, very important source of information for many companies to, to make that future planning and forecast and things like that. In addition to that, uh, there's also this huge explosion of data available today that enables uh, retailers to become more specific, more personal with customers. Uh, most importantly, the open data initiative, which enables uh, access to demographic data, weather data, and so on. Um, there's some interesting examples, like, for example, uh, L'Oreal's lipstick effect, where they correlated 
the uh, economic indicators, unemployment information to what products or categories actually sell when unemployment goes up. Up and they found lipstick was the, the hot seller there. And those kind of correlations, when they just take these disparate data sets that are available, combine it with their sales data, they come up with interesting insights, things they didn't know existed. And this enables them to plan better, figure out what the inventory should be, better plan out their supply chain and so on. So it has a huge impact to business, huge impact to inventory and their bottom line. Uh, the other aspect that that's an interesting example that you uh, uh, positioned there, Sheesh, uh, about the L'Oreal and the lipstick, and and I, I recall actually uh, reading that, and that there's some real value in uh, understanding the importance of of why that took place. Unemployment, you know, that 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 has a little that has a little something to do with like putting uh, putting people in a kind of a downward spiral, and lipstick is meant, when you think about it, it's meant to illuminate and give some self-worth uh, to the individual. So I can see that correlation very, very clearly in the fact that, yes, unemployment is where it is, and, uh, yep. and I, I need to look best. I need to increase my self-worth. I need to go out and get a new job, you know? So I can see that coming together. That's a really good example. And there's another one from Walmart where they looked at, you know, what are the top 10 products to sell when there's a hurricane forecast. So they had all the data over years uh, of all the different stores that, you know, uh, were in the path of hurricanes, and they mined all that data. But they also needed this public data, you know, like weather data so they could do the correlation and say, uh, over the years, these are the stores, these were the dates during which a hurricane went past that store, what are the products that sold as a result, and they mined all that information. The top 10 was pretty obvious, emergency supplies and so on. Number one was a huge surprise. It was Pop-Tarts, specifically strawberry Pop-Tarts. So really, you know, uh, these are the kinds of things that, that retailers are doing where they're saying yeah. data is available, and we combine the data from all these different sources. We can understand what customers want yeah. and be able to better prepare our inventory and supply chain for that eventuality. Yeah. Did you say pop charts? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was, it yeah. was strawberry well, pop-tarts. Uh, let's face it. You probably don't need to cook them. They're, they're just as good uh, uh, right out of the box, and that's probably why, because they're an easy easy access. Yeah. To exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's probably what, what the reason. And, and the other aspect uh, I have here is uh, the Internet of Things, which is, you know, this hot new area in retail where – uh, almost every retailer that I'm talking to is exploring the Internet of Things. And the reason yeah. they're doing this is they want to understand the behavior of their customers in the store. And talking about omnichannel, online, they can, they can get your behavior based on the web logs. They, they know exactly what you clicked on. They know what you looked for. They know what you added to the shopping cart. They know what time you shop. So all this information is available online. But yeah. the huge gap in retail has always been, what's your behavior like in the store? Where do you browse? What time do you come in? What's mm -hmm. the path you take to the store? Do you stop for a considerably long time in front of a, a particular product and so on? So that information today with the Internet of Things is available. There are sensors in store. There's connect devices and beacons that are really tracking people within the store, understanding behavior within the store, and as a result, enabling retailers to better optimize the store experience, create a layout that works, create a shelf layout and a store layout that really benefits the customer, enables a better experience, and so on. And, and retailers are really taking the data and using it in interesting ways in determining, you know, what time of day is busiest, what day of week is busiest, how should we optimize our workforce as a result yeah. uh, of, of the data we have, uh, which products and shelves attract the most attention, 
how can we drive traffic into certain areas of the store? So those are kind of questions they can answer with that data. And also, when they combine it with the online data now, they know your behavior online, they know your behavior in the store. That combination gives them a huge amount of insight into, into your, your shopping patterns and behavior across these channels. Yeah. So, Shish, you actually just touched on a really good point. So let me um, go to the next slide here. We've been talking a lot about data, but that's still only one aspect of the omni-channel. Um, so there are other areas which we'll probably go into deep dive sessions and future sessions. Um, but very quickly, can you sort of talk about the different ways of how retailers can apply the insights that they glean from their data into back-end office processes? Yeah, sure. So uh, some of these things, uh, the, the areas highlighted here, things like e-commerce and business intelligence and supply chain and CRM, uh, all of the data that's collected, whether it's online, across the different channels, in the store, really benefits all of these areas. Uh, for example, uh, the data collected helps optimizing the experience in the e-commerce environment. So based on the information I have about your shopping pattern in store and across the different channels, what you look for, what you've bought, the personalization online, the pricing online, uh, your experience online in the e-commerce environment will be tailored specifically for you. The other aspect that it also benefits, the data that is collected, is a lot of times the patterns that we look at, the correlation between trending topics in social media, for instance, and certain products selling. Uh, the example that I talked about, which is uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter, we have football trending and then beer sales as a result. Uh, in real time, it is almost impossible for the supply chain to react, but if we take all these data points and we know there's specific correlations between trending topics and a category of product that sells, that data can actually be pulled in as business rules for the supply chain. So when we see that happening and we can predict the trend that it's going to keep on rising, we can notify the supply chain and have uh, you know, the manufacturing processes prepare for this process, uh, have the stocking in time, and so on. Uh, at the same time, from a uh, campaigns and CRM perspective, uh, all of this data, the behavioral information that we're getting from across the different channels, what do you search for in mobile, what do you search for in the store, that enables us to get a lot more information about you, create uh, micro-segmentation, and be able to drive campaigns that are more relevant and specific based on all the information we have across these channels. I actually came across a, a really interesting um, uh, situation just the other day where an organization um, in the supply chain and delivery space is trying to uh, uh, revolutionize uh, the actual time to delivery to a customer. Uh, imagine, if you will, and, and I, I have this on good authority, that it normally takes from fresh market produce, by the time it's gone through the distribution, off to your local grocery store, and then picked up by a customer, that's a 14-day cycle. So the idea that the, the label on that food be considered fresh, hmm, you know, it's a little questionable when you think about it. So what my client has done is investigating um, an option, in a sense, to cut out the middleman. In other words, involve themselves with the primary producer, in a sense, open a virtual store, and then by virtue of a cloud-based solution that rests on Microsoft Azure platform, uh, allows the customer to shop online, even down to a single unit of an Apple, and then have it delivered to an alternate pickup location. Not even actually have to go to a store, but the package is prepackaged, put at this uh, pickup location, and you don't even have to get out of your car. You can actually go get it. I think this is going to be revolutionary. It's early days that uh, I'll be happy to uh, update the audience uh, as this develops, because I think it's absolutely a category killer.
very you make a, yeah you make a very brilliant point there uh in, in fact that, that reminds me that uh this whole thing is really you know the cloud especially uh is enabling retailers to explore a lot of new models as a result because uh the cloud actually enables the seamless integration between channels and that's that's a huge thing for for many retailers that I'm working with and as you rightly pointed out, they're working on Azure to create that integration between store and online. And it's really driving uh, business models like the click and collect, uh, where uh, as a retailer, a customer could go in and, and place an order online. Uh, but re brick and mortar is now competing with online. Online is competing with brick and mortar. Uh, and they're looking for agility. They're looking for quick delivery and so on. And brick and mortar has an advantage that every store can be treated as a warehouse and have pickup in the closest store. So the cloud really enables uh, that seamless inventory. When I place an order online, it will look at the warehouse. It will look at my location. It will look at the closest store. Uh, to my location, see if the inventory in the closest store can support my my purchase, and if it does, it let me pick it up from that closest store in the in the shortest time possible. So Absolutely. those kind of business models was something that was not possible in 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 the non cloud environment because the data exchange and the silos really prevented that. Removing that silos, removing you know having one inventory for warehouse and one inventory for the store, breaking that silo really made this the scenario possible. So this is great segue into my next uh, sort of area that I want to talk about. I'm sure our listeners are all wondering at this point, with so much data that's available, um, how do they get started? How do they break this into stages where they can Tackle and tackle their data, um, and what are the tools that are available to them? So, uh, one of the things that I, I talked about earlier is uh, in the past, many retailers used the data they owned about the customer, and generally from a single channel. Uh, Gartner talks about three P's of data, and the three P's of data is proprietary, public, and purchased. So, in the past, retailers primarily worked with proprietary data. This was structured data. Today, they have access to, in addition to that structured data, which typically would be in a SQL Server database or some other structured database, but today you have access to the web log files, all the interactions that happen on the web logs on, on, online. You may have uh, access to social media interactions and social media data. You may have also access to weather data and see what is the impact of weather have on shopping patterns. Uh, demographic data and interesting correlations that you can derive from that to see what's the demographic around the store, what's the median income and age around the store, what impact does it have on the sale of certain products and categories for that store. So all that data is available. And the huge challenge of many retailers space today is how do we deal with all this data? We know the data we have, we have a place for it, it is in a database and we can analyze that information. But what about all this new data? Uh, one of the recommendations we actually make is to say, instead of trying to figure out a data model and a data warehouse for all this weather data and social data and web log data, it is best to treat them in a more agile way and say, let's deal with it as unstructured data. One of the things that's become very popular over the last few years is really the concept of unstructured data platforms. Uh, platforms like Hadoop that can handle data in its raw form and not really worry about uh, creating data models and things like that, things that took a long time to build. So, uh, rather, just take the data as it is, throw it onto an unstructured data platform, process it in near real time, combine it with the data you have and be able to get insights from it immediately. Uh, the other challenge many retailers have as well is all of this new data obviously is going to take a lot of space. We don't have enough resources in our data center to deal with it. And that's where we're really seeing an uptake on the cloud. The cloud really comes in, and Microsoft's Azure platform is really where a lot of retailers are looking at and saying, we want the ability to store the data and pay for 
only the storage we use, rather than saying, I need a petabyte of storage, I'll pay for it now, and then as it grows, I want to be able to continue using the the storage in there uh, and, 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 and filling it up. And when it gets filled up, I want to buy another server and so on. Rather, the cloud enables the elasticity. As the data grows, uh, it automatically allocates more space and you pay for what you use. And, and that concept is really catching on and retailers are saying, this, is, this, is, this allows us to deal with this huge amount of data where we don't even know how much data we, we're going to store, but the cloud will just elastically grow and, and let us handle it. Um, the, the other aspect is also uh, retailers are talking about how do we now, you know, we've got the weather data, we've got the social media data, we've got demographics data, we've got our data. We have the ability to store it. The cloud lets us do it. But I don't know how to do some interesting things with it. I want to combine it and do some prediction about what my customer will want to buy. Will they like a certain product? Will they like a certain category? I'm running a campaign. Who should I drive this campaign towards? Who's the target audience? I want to be very specific, very relevant with the customer, and I want to make it a very accurate prediction. But I have no idea how I can combine all of this. And till recently, that whole thing about combining data and doing interesting analytics and predictions with it was a very, very complex thing. You needed uh, open source tools or very advanced analytics tools like SAS and SPSS and R and Python programming tools and concepts. Uh, today, uh, we've actually democratized the advanced analytics. And there is a product that we released last year called Azure Machine Learning or Azure ML, which actually reduces that concept to a very simple workspace where a data scientist can go in and say, I want to use these data sources. I want to apply these specific algorithms to it. It's done in a very visual manner. They create a very advanced predictive model with it and then run the data through it and it, and it spits out the recommendations and predictions that they can use in their campaigns, the assortments, the inventory, and so on. Uh, so the concept of advanced analytics today, because of visual tools like Azure ML, has become very simple. It is in the cloud. And, and my recommendation really is to, to take it in steps and say, step one, I want to use my proprietary data. Step two, I want to combine this external data and use the cloud for storage. I don't want to be buying data center resources for it. I want to do it cheaply. And third, I want to use an advanced analytics tool like Azure ML to, to come up with some interesting predictions and recommendations from this combination of data. Uh, and finally, the last mile, uh, generally what, what a lot of retailers are looking for is how can we empower our business users who have no technical and advanced analytic skills to be able to use this information? And that's really where we enabled a lot of these capabilities into tools that they're familiar with, tools like Excel. Excel can connect to the back-end big data systems, to Hadoop, to Teradata, to Oracle, to SQL, uh, and look at the combinations of information in a very visual manner and empower business users to make those decisions. So, you mentioned agility. So, maybe you could help clarify some things. Um, trying to get a 360 degree view when you're dealing with multiple data sources, such as in store, online, sensors, social media. All this adds a great deal of complexity because you, they, organizations now need to manage a variety of data sources. So how is it that they're able to stay agile? Super. So uh, on the slide that you have now, there is a word that's uh, kind of highlighted. It says data lake, and that's a word that uh, has been heard a lot lately in the last few months, I would say. Uh, the media has been full of the word data lake. And this is a concept that's 
is really taking companies by storm. Uh, most IT departments are saying this is something that will help solve a problem that we're having. And the problem is something that I alluded to earlier where I said for a retailer to become effective and competitive, they need to be able to use all of the data that is available out there. Uh, I could use only the data that I'm collecting in my in my structured databases and be able to predict what customers want, but the accuracy of that is not going to be very significant. Uh, but if I combine what impact does weather have on my decisions, what impact does my income level have on whether I will like a product or service, what impact does my age group have on my affinity to a certain product or service. So when I combine all of these things, my behavior online, my behavior in mobile, uh, my demographic information, the weather, all of these things, the accuracy of what I will like, the accuracy of what I'm likely to buy just goes up exponentially. Uh, so retailers do benefit from combining all this data, but the challenge really lies in if I take all this data, I now have to build this massive data warehouse where I define the structure and model for all these data sources, for the weather, for demographic data, for social data. Uh, and, and then I define how do I pull all this information in. So in the traditional data warehouse world, uh, uh, IT did something called ETL, Extract, Transform, and Load. It is very tedious. Uh, time-consuming process. It could take up to a year for defining that structure, connecting to the data sources, identifying the data sources, and then pulling everything together so that the business people can make the decisions with these combinations of data. Uh, in many cases, this became a very long exercise, a very expensive exercise, and seldom got completed. So. The concept of data lake really, really uh, turns everything upside down and provides a new way of dealing with it and saying, I know there's all this data available out there, the web logs and social and mobile and weather and all of that. I have no idea how I'm going to use it and when I'm going to use it, but I'm going to pull everything in without really worrying about creating a data model for it. I'm going to pull it in as is, throw it into what's conceptually called a data lake in the format that it comes in so that I have the data available and ready to go. And this is typically in a cloud environment like Microsoft Azure. I'll pull all the data in. And then we have another product that actually enables business users to use this data, create these data pipes. It's a product called Azure Data Factory. Azure Data Factory enables IT to say, let's take the weather data and the sales data, combine the two, transform them in a way that business can use it, convert it to a data pipe, and provide it to business. So business can connect to the data pipe with Excel, pull the data in, and do some interesting visualization, analysis, and reporting with it, and be able to make the decisions with that combination of data. Uh, and IT will typically, on demand, uh, look at situations where uh, business, merchandising, wants a combination of demographics data and campaign data and say, we want to see what was the correlation between different age groups and income levels and how the campaign really fared, the sales. So I want a combination of that data. So IT will actually look at the two data sources in the data lake, combine them, define what that combination looks like, create a data pipe, and give it to merchandising. Merchandising will take that data pipe, connect it to Excel, and then do some interesting reporting with it with self-service. So it's on demand. When business needs to answer a question, a data pipe will be provided to them. But IT will actually just say, we have all this data available. We'll pull that into the lake and not that they can get their hands on, something that's uh, expandable 
but something that, that they can actually uh, get their head around really, really quickly. So uh, I, I didn't think it, it looked confusing, but after your explanation, I, I can honestly say I really love this approach. And I think it's something that uh, uh, has a long, uh, a long uh, capability in like at least introducing someone, uh, introducing the organization to what it feels like. And, and, and kind of, in a sense, helps ramp them up for uh, the future. And, and this is this is a is a concept that uh, a lot of companies are extremely excited about. One of the companies that we've been working with is uh, Alaska Airlines, where they had they wanted to collect data from all these different sources. One of the sources was the entertainment devices. When you board a flight in Alaska and you pick up an entertainment device, which is a slate, and you start watching movies, you interact with it. There's a lot of interaction that happens with that device. And the key clicks, the telemetric data is one of those data points they collect to, to understand your behavior, your preferences. And that in combination with all the other data, they put everything into a data lake and then they use Azure Data Factory to create data pipes with that combinations of data to better understand your behavior and what kind of offers and services you'd like as a result based on, on the last interaction you had with the entertainment device. Yeah, well, you know, this retailers are trying to fight every form of challenge. I mean, I, I can think of a, a hundred examples, but one that uh, that popped up uh, recently, I saw a national uh, shoe store who, um, who 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 decided to face the channel the challenge of uh, retail uh, space, retail leasing space being expensive, and the demanding customer wanting more and more and better quality items and and rather than uh, rather than build on their infrastructure they actually uh, built out what's classified as um, an extended aisle approach so it <laughs> this actually sits in the cloud and it actually offers the customer almost three times the store that they they can actually you know that they could normally visit and I think uh, obviously They've taken the approach of uh, looking at the information that the customers were giving them, looking at the challenges that they're faced with, and the solution was, let's do something about it. So we can't build a store, so let's build a virtual presence mm -hmm. and allow our customers access to that. Yeah, you make a very excellent point there. I think uh, one of the things that a great takeaway is that the access to all of this data, the access to the omni-channel and cloud environment really enables retailers to look at what new business models can we look at. And one of those things, as you rightly pointed out, is many of the retailers that I'm working with, because of the cloud, they're saying one of the things that we can enable today is explore smaller store footprints. Uh, and this reduces the overall cost structure as well for stores. At the same time, the, the challenge with small, smaller store formats is that all the products obviously are not going to be available. But the, with the availability of data, with the availability of predictive technologies like Azure ML, it is possible to become far more accurate in the inventory and assortment by store based on the demographic and past purchase data and social media trend information, all of that, it is possible to get far more accurate in what inventory to carry, physical inventory to carry in the store. And as a result, retailers can explore that notion of saying, we can make our stores much smaller and then have that extension to it, that omni-channel experience within the store with the endless aisle and have part of the store as a virtual store with digital shelves and say, here's a digital shelf that we'll provide for our customers where they can order in that digital environment, have it shipped home. And then there is specific products that they want to buy right now. We know what they are based on the analysis of all the data and, and past information that we have. So, so that's really that, those new business models that can be explored in addition to things like click and collect. So, should you talk about Azure ML and, and predictive analytics, can you maybe talk about the analytics maturity model and sort of where you're finding a lot of the companies that you're currently working with? 
Yeah, sure. So uh, most of the companies uh, that, that I'm working with, these are the three stages where I would say you know, the descriptive being where pretty much every company is uh, looking at past purchase, you know, what's happened and reporting on it and so on. Uh, most of them are in the descriptive stage. Many are in the predictive stage because of the tools like Azure ML being available and democratizing that whole advanced analytic capability. In the past, uh, advanced analytics was something that only a few companies had access to because of the skill levels needed. You needed to have a data scientist who was typically a PhD in math who also knew programming because most of the tools were programming intensive. Uh, they had to be very technical because uh, the data scientists had to actually find many of the open source tools, install them, support themselves, and so on. Uh, so the skill levels was was rather high, but today what we've done is we've created these very visual tools like Azure ML that enables data scientists to be very productive without having programming skills and very high technical skills. They can be very good data scientists, have the math skills, and that's typically enough. Uh, and as a result, many companies that we've been working with are doing recommendations, churn analytics, uh, demand forecasting, and so on. And most importantly, personalizing the experience for the customer by better predicting what kind of products and services every customer would like, and then customizing the store based on the demographics around it and so on. So this is an area that is growing very, very rapidly because of the availability of the tools and the technology today. Uh, where a lot of companies are going towards, the next step is really the prescriptive stage and say, how can we now uh, go to the next step and have the, the technologies really prescribe to the BDMs, to the business decision makers on, on what should be the inventory level, what kind of campaign should I run, what, where should I run my advertising, uh, what words should I purchase, keywords should I purchase in my search engine uh, optimization and so on. So really being very prescriptive in that process is where a lot of uh, retailers are going. You know, she, you know, she, I know I'm, I, I seem to be the guy with the real life examples, but I think that's the world I live in. Uh, just to, just to uh, add some color commentary to that uh, really well placed dialogue is that I'm actually, I have the pleasure currently of working with a, a brand new startup. Um, I, I, their, their name shall remain, <laughs> they, they shall remain nameless at this point because they are going through some evolution of their own. But as I take a look at this, uh, I take a look at this particular slide, I can see they've initially started out as a data capture service. And it's a service that actually positions itself at the retail store in between the scanning process and the actual cash register process. And it is also a cloud-based solution supported by Azure. And that interceptor um, uh, technology has given at least a basket analysis. It takes a basket analysis of, a, of what's in, uh, in that particular sale uh, event at the, at the moment. Now, the customer is faceless at this point, but I see that what will happen is, and uh, we, it's forecasted, uh, is that we are then going to take the product into the next stage and become a bit, little bit more predictive based on, those, uh, based on those baskets and start to develop some couponing and some, uh, um, and, and some recommendations to the, to the retail client about how they should uh, position the specific products that they're selling. I know as an ex-retailer myself, uh, selling at the optimum price is the best, removing markdown dollars, you know, and, and really watching bottom line is, is critical. The next stage that is planned with this organization is that actually they involve the retailers now to capture uh, from their customers the minimum an email which address which then puts a face to that basket and allows us to further influence the individual, not just the retailer, but now the individual customer. And um, 
the ultimate position I see for my client is that they will, in actual fact, become a data company, uh, a data company working on a platform that that, it, that would look for uh, to build an ecosystem of additional services uh, to complement that that whole picture, and that seems to be the trend. Um, I would imagine that over the next six months, uh, you're probably going to hear a lot more about this organization and uh, ask you to stay tuned. Um, great. So I guess just one sort of final question to you, Peter, um, for any of our listeners that are out there and they want to get started, um, how, how can they get started? Well, it may, be, it may sound a little self-serving, but I think... Uh, <laughs> The only thing I can default to is that, that they call us, but they call us for a, a, a free one-day evaluation, uh, perhaps of their e-commerce, their CRM, their current BI situation, maybe their mobile or systems integration requirements. What I can guarantee is that we'll deliver an evaluation of the existing landscape and offer them an omnichannel solutions roadmap. Uh, that includes user experience and flows and offers them a project plan and a statement of work to take them to the next phase. This, are, this is our specific approach to doing business. It's organic in nature. Uh, the outcome of that, of that evaluation is, in fact, a product that you can take away and you can start the process yourself. Or if, in fact, while you were engaged with us in that evaluation, Maybe at that point you could decide whether or not to utilize the help of uh, the team at TechBlocks. And uh, I'd appreciate uh, the experience either way. Thanks, Andy. So that concludes our session for today. Um, I would like to thank Shish and Peter for the amazing dialogue and commentary. Um, we will now be taking questions. If you do have any questions, feel free to log them into the chat window. Um, but thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I do have one question to you, Shish. You spoke of agility in BI. Can you give us a real-life example of how you could quantify or calculate ROI based on studies or experience? Uh, well, for ROI, a uh, couple of things. It depends on the use case. So um, many of the uh, examples that we've seen is uh, around predictions. So one of them was uh, for a beverage company that we work with, they were looking at forecasting demand. Um, and the existing forecast model was not accurate. And typically for forecasting models, uh, the way we look at accuracy is by looking at past data. And typically we'll take about 80% of the past data, build a model with it, and take the remaining 20% of the data uh, typically and score it against that to determine how accurate is that model. And we actually did this exercise with the beverage company, looked at the existing model. They were getting about 60% accuracy on their prediction. Uh, and they were not using a lot of external data sources to determine, uh, you know, what the demand for the beverage would be in different cities. Uh, we actually took uh, additional publicly available data, like, for example, weather and social media data and so on to determine how much impact does a holiday have on consumption of the beverage? How much impact does a sporting event have on the consumption of the beverage? How much impact does a campaign have and so on? So once all that data was put in and a model was built, we actually took historic data, uh, 80% of the data was taken to train the model, and the remaining 20% was used for scoring the model. And the accuracy of the model actually went up significantly to about 80%. And that really gives us an indicator that says, here is a model that gives us a significantly higher accuracy in prediction 
of what the consumption will be, and that is the basis on which we calculate the ROI and say uh, we will have lesser out of stock, we'll have lesser overstock as a result, and each of these has a dollar value associated with it. So I think we only have time for one more question. Um, can you give some real-world examples of how organizations are leveraging social media data, such as Twitter and LinkedIn? The, uh, the most common way that most companies are using is really the sentiment analysis. Marketing will say, here's the brand sentiment. Is it positive? It's negative. And being able to respond in a timely manner to any po a possible negative sentiment, that's the most common one using listening software. But the most interesting ones that I've seen is really establishing correlations. Uh, one of the uh, use cases is today, uh, most campaigns are run with very broad segmentation of customers, and the accuracy of that campaign may be questionable. But with the availability of social media data, where even if you look at Facebook, uh, there is information about you know what you like, what services you like, what places you like. There's a lot more information about you in social media sources like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. And if I take that information and and use it in my segmentation, I'm going to get far more granular customer segmentation. There's going to be micro-segmentation as a result. So instead of the 20 to 30-year-old who may like a product or service, I may have the 20-year-old who lives in Seattle, who likes a certain book, who likes a certain type of music, is a category. And I can put uh, thousands of my customers into that very granular category. I can make very accurate predictions on that granular category and define uh, what kind of campaign do I want to run, what kind of offers do I want to give to this category, and this becomes a far more accurate one than than in the past where I create these offers and campaigns for the 20 to 30 year old. Uh, and that's one huge advantage of using social media. The other one that I talked about earlier was really the correlations and say, can we find some interesting patterns in social media data that will tell us, you know, when this particular topic is trending in social media, we know a certain category of product is going to sell, and we can use that information in future forecasting. The other aspect, if I can add on to that, Annie, um, um, is the fact that it's a great a domain and environment for developing some advocacy amongst users. Because I think that it's important, uh, you, you recall I spoke, uh, I talked about the need for retailers to listen to their customers and watch their habits and, and, and understand uh, uh, what they like, when, when they like it. Um, you know, it's the influence that your friend has on something, you know, needs to, needs to be given some real credit here. And I think that uh, 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 social media, Twitter, and LinkedIn, you can see it every day. There's somebody giving it a like and actually adding a comment, you know. And I think that needs to be structured into any uh, realistic uh, go-to-market plan uh, for a retailer today. That's for sure. Well, I think we're out of time here. Um, so I apologize in advance if we weren't able to get to your questions. We will be following up with you directly. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, and have a great day. Thanks very much, Annie. And uh, yeah. nice to speak to you, uh, Sheesh. Nice to speak to you, too, Peter. Pleasure. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Are you still there? Yep.